Good evening, everyone. And good evening to those who are watching online and also watching on the recording. We're going to begin our proceedings this evening with an opening prayer from the Reverend Jaquan Beecham. Welcome, and you'll hear more about what's happening next. Will you join me in a posture of prayer? Gracious God, the one who has been there since the start, divine creator, open our ears, hearts, and our minds. We uplift our institutions to you today, the institutions that have gatekept, dismissed, and overcorrected, and the institutions that have also formed, empowered, and radicalized. May we acknowledge the God talk that has inspired us to this juncture of our lives, while not holding on too tightly to the theologies that we've entered in with here. May we leave some space for grace. Soothe us, Holy One. So we might hear something new from you through the words of our speaker this evening. May we receive more of a shared language, a Rolodex, to relate to one another anew as we engage in the spectrum of the secular and the sacred with the knowledge that it is all the same to you, justice and transformation. Amen and amen. amen. Thank you, Reverend Beecham. It's my pleasure to introduce this year's Bauer Broholm Lecture 2024 at Andover Newton Seminary at Yale Divinity School. I greet you on behalf of Andover Newton and also Dr. Bradley P. Bauer, Andover Newton Doctor of Ministry 2016, my colleague, friend, advisory council member, and the inspiration behind the Bauer Broholm Lecture on the intersection of faith and work. This endowed lecture honors Andover Newton's former Center for the Ministry of the Laity, which made the bold assertion starting in the 1980s that the most important contributions laypersons could make to the Christian faith weren't necessarily about what they would do in the church, but how they would bring their formation into every interaction, institution, and community they encounter within and beyond the church's walls. This lectureship also honors the Reverend Dick Broholm, a minister dear to Brad Bauer and to our speaker this evening, who helped to build up the Center for the Ministry of the Laity and who caused his contemporaries and those who came after him to imagine a faith that was bigger than the church and thus a more adequate reflection of Jesus's charge that we spread God's love. I'm delighted that you're here for this year's Bauer Broholm Lecture. And now I turn to Associate Dean Ned Parker to situate this event in the bigger picture. Special welcome to those of you joining online. Thank you for being with us. We're grateful for the ability to broadcast and to record lectures like this one, the Bauer Broholm Lecture. Andover Newton has a long tradition of teaching and learning that extends far beyond the classroom. Visit the resources page on our website, andovernewton.yale.edu, to find lectures, worship prompts, and inspiring devotional series. Andover Newton is committed to being a source of new knowledge. To that end, we are building upon this resource hub, a platform from which we strive to nurture head and heart. As we build, we seek interaction and engagement. This evening, we invite you to interact by sending us questions to be answered at the end. Finally, please join us on April 4th. You can join us online for this too, for the Woodbury Leadership Workshop with New Haven leader, Carlton Highsmith. Find more information on our event page. Thank you and welcome. Thank you, Dr. Parker. We'll now hear an introduction of our speaker from Student Steering Committee member, Courtney Estevez. For more than 90 years, Lumnos, previously known as Faith at Work, has helped people discern and live out their callings. For the past 23 of those years, Doug Waisaki Johnson, has been Luminosa's executive director. An Andover Newton Theological School graduate, 
Doug is ordained in the Evangelical Covenant Church. He served UCC and Covenant churches in Vermont and Massachusetts, and he's dedicated much of his career to helping leaders to thrive. He offers workshops on emotional intelligence, resiliency strategies, and balance. He's developed a specialized repertoire of interventions tailored especially to the spiritual needs of those who serve in healthcare. A pastor, consultant, and author, Doug is here to inspire those who care about leadership and institutions and give us new theoretical frameworks for making spiritual sense of them. He will speak this evening on the topic, a very personal theology of institutions. Please join me in welcoming Doug Waisaki Johnson. That was the hardest part of the night is pronouncing my name. Oh, no, no. Great. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the welcome. Thanks to the Bauer family who are, made this lecture possible. Thanks for the hospitality that Andover Newton has offered me. I, this is a bit of a, a full circle kind of moment for me. I'm a, I'm a grad of Andover Newton's almost 40 years and uh, preparing this lecture has given me the opportunity to reflect on my years that I had at Andover Newton in a way that I haven't in a long time. And part of that realization as I've been doing that reflection is that um, my time during those years at Andover Newton really changed my life in some significant ways that I really haven't thought about for a long time. And um, including meeting the, uh, one of the primary mentors of my life, who is Dick Broholm, for whom this lectureship is named. But I really also had what I would consider a second conversion at Andover Newton. I, I grew up in the evangelical church, and it, it, it's not the evangelical church that we know today, but still, it's the evangelical church. And, and I will always be grateful for what I learned there, but I really needed a second kind of conversion to um, more of what, what things like justice meant in the world and a more inclusive theology. And it wasn't until I got to Andover Newton that I found the language and the theology to undergird what God was doing in my life already. And so, um, so I'm just really grateful to the institution of Andover Newton. And again, it's just really wonderful to be back here. And um, I guess I would say to you students, um, pay attention, because I, I have no idea some of the seeds that were planted in me when I was at Andover Newton. And it's only uh, upon reflection that I realized that, um, that there was more going on in those years than I was aware of. And again, part of that was really meeting some significant mentors in my life. And my field ed experience at Andover Newton really shaped me in terms of some of the things we're going to talk about tonight. I, I had a field ed placement uh, at a wonderful church on the south shore of Boston, United Church of Christ in Norwell. And I remember my first day at that church as an as a Andover Newton field ed student. My first Sunday, I walked into the church. And I picked up the bulletin, and the bulletin at the bottom, it said something like, minister to the congregation, David Norling, minister to, ministers to the community, all the congregation. And now I see that around a lot. But back in 1985, I had never seen that before. I had no idea what that even really meant to say to the congregation that you, too, our ministers. And that was a church that really took that calling seriously and, and built it into their framework. And again, it was the start of my journey around this whole topic of, of faith and work and the intersections and all of, all of that. Um, and it's led as, as my introduction, uh, that lovely introduction to 23 years working in this field. And, and the last 15 has been primarily in healthcare. And so I've really had the opportunity, the, the privilege of sitting with physicians and nurses and nurse practitioners and help them just think about um, 
how their work connects with their deepest values. So every month I sit in a group with healthcare professionals and we sit in a circle or we sit on Zoom and there's some content for that session. But really the primary question in those meetings is in the last few weeks, has there been a patient encounter that was significant to you? And significant, not from a clinical perspective, clinicians have plenty of opportunities to do that, but significant from its impact on you. And significant might mean it was deeply painful or hard, or it was joyful, or it was meaningful, and just creating the kind of space for people to, to talk about how their work is impacting them. I can say more about that later if you want to. So, a theology of institutions. It's a mouthful, right? The first time I heard Dick Grohome talk about a theology of institutions, I think I looked like, you know how when you talk to your dog and the dog doesn't really understand what you're saying and they sort of tilt their head? <laughs> that was me as Dick Grohome talked about the <clears throat> theology of institution, institutions. But here, here's a very simple organization specific Descript one sentence description of a theology of institutions. God loves Landry bicycle shops. God loves Landry bicycle shops. When I first heard Tom Henry, also an Andover Newton grad, but then the CEO of Landry Bicycles in the Boston area, say those words, it stopped me in my tracks. Landry Cycle, again, it's an independent chain of about eight or nine bicycle stores in the Boston area. And he didn't just say, God loves the people who work at Landry Cycle. No, he said, God loves the company, the institution, the store. According to Tom, this revelation for him was a kind of New testament -y, scales dropping from your eyes, knock you off your donkey kind of epiphany to realize that God loved this company where he worked. And it led he and his brother to a number of actions. Externally, they became fierce advocates for the biking industry, lobbying communities and governments and anyone who would listen on the positive role of uh, biking for your health and in the environment. Internally, it led them to really focus on this idea of calling. So everyone who worked at Landry Cycle had some classes and some courses about how their work truly was a calling that made the world a better place. It also led them to make Landry an ESOP, uh, an employee-owned company. All this while doing the very difficult work of running a business in a crowded and fiercely competitive market. Turns out a lot of people are selling bicycles in the Boston area. But they made all these changes. So this idea of a, that God loves Landry Cycle was not just some ethereal idea, but it was something that actually changed the way that company operated. Now, perhaps you're thinking that the time has passed for a theology of institutions. After all, don't we now live in the gig economy, the independent contractor 1099 economy? Hasn't that ship already sailed? It is true. It's true that the work, the shape of work is changing. And it is very, very, very true that our trust in organizations and institutions has diminished greatly, whether we're talking about the government or a bank, or a church. That said, if I could just walk you through a partial imaginary trip through your day, I think it might be a good reminder to all of us about the impact that institutions still have on us every day. 
So I don't know this about you, but I'm just going to kind of make this up. You begin your day with coffee, right? If your first cup of coffee is made at home, it might be Pete's or it might be Nespresso. If you are stopping somewhere to get your coffee on the way to school, it's Duncan, right? Because we're in New England, of course, it's never Starbucks. If you're a consumer of the news, you rely on the New York Times or CNN or MSNBC or Fox News. However you get your news, you're reading about the war in Gaza or Ukraine, or you're reading about the State of the Union address tonight. And when that starts to just feel like a little bit too much, you flip over to the arts and entertainment section or the sports page. So media companies, governments, military, movie companies, sports teams, all of these, all of these are organizations. So if you go to work in a car, you get, you get in your Ford or Toyota, or you take the train or the bus, or I don't know what it is in New Haven here, you take the MBTA or the MTA or the L if you're in Chicago. If you're a pastor, you go to work at a church, that's an institution, and on your schedule are some hospital visits, and that's an institution too. And then you realize that you still have a check from that funeral that you did last week, and you need to deposit that in the bank so you don't stop at a bank, but you use your mobile app but you're interacting with an institution and on and on it goes till the end of the day, till you're exhausted and you need to decompress. So you turn on Netflix and you enjoy a few scoops of Ben and Jerry's ice cream and I just need to do that as a shout out to my state of Vermont. <laughs> I could continue, but you get my point. Gig economy or not, institutions impact us in a thousand different ways. And given their enormous potential for good and for harm in our lives, shouldn't we be thinking theologically about them? The answer is yes, we should. <laughs> but ironically, that has generally not been true in our world, especially in the church. In my experience, Historically, the church has either ignored the importance of institutions or stood outside of them as critics. In the church, we talk a lot about ourselves, the importance of church and its parallel organizations. We're very clear that God loves the church, bride of Christ, and all that. And we encourage people to think about what role they might play in the church. You could be a deacon or a trustee. But our approach to the institutions where our parishioners work has been one either of benign neglect or critiquing from the outside. And that's especially for true for those of us who locate ourselves in the progressive wing of Christianity. We are quick to point to the racial practices of redlining in the banking industry, the price gouging of big pharma, the many, 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 many sins of Exxon. And those are all valid critiques. But how often do we ask people about the organizations and the institutions where they work? When and where and how have we created the space to help people think theologically about where they work? I hadn't thought about any of that until I got to Andover Newton and met Dick Rohoven. And I got to listen in on some of the conversations between him and people like Carol and George Bauer and others and began to realize that their thinking matched some of the thinking of John Gardner, who said, pity the leader caught between unloving critics and uncritical lovers. Have you heard that before? Pity the leader caught between unloving critics and uncritical lovers. You see, Gardner felt that institutions were trapped between those persons, often on the inside of organizations who are complacent and unwilling to see the institution change on the one hand, and between prophets, usually on the outside, who insisted that the institution must change or else they're gonna tear it down. His call was for people who could clearly see the institution's failures but also their potential. Leaders who will, were willing to risk and invest themselves in enabling our institutions to truly serve society. 
I do believe there's a role for those standing outside of institutions for that prophetic role, but we need mostly people who have a more incarnational Jesus-like theology that could be loving critics, those who are willing to stand within our institutions, love them, and in ways large and small work towards their wholeness. Which, you probably know from your own experience, is really, really, really hard. Like you could probably think of some of the places you have worked already. And what, it, what does it mean to be a loving critic in those kind of places. I see this every day in my work with clinicians who feel this deep calling to medicine, but now their practice has just been bought out by a private equity firm who's requiring that they only spend 15 minutes with you, their patients. They want to spend more time, but they have new ownership now and that's the requirement because it improves the bottom line. Or nurses who are dealing with the nursing shortage in their hospital. And so now the hospital is bringing in travelers and they're working alongside these travelers who are making twice as much money as they are. And they're trying to figure out how to be a team together in that kind of environment. Shouldn't we in the church be trying to stand alongside our parishioners who are wrestling with these questions? Shouldn't we be willing to leave the comfortable world of our church language and be willing to uncomfortably be learners with them and understand their stories? I'm gonna offer you a couple of concrete suggestions on how that might happen in a bit, but first I wanna just for a few minutes dig a little bit deeper into what a theology of institutions might look like. If we were to try to go a little bit beyond God loves Landry cycle, what would it look like? And here I'm going to offer you four theological assumptions. These are taken from the groundbreaking work that was done by two Andover Newton alumni. One is Dick Roholm, who we've already talked about. The yeah, second is David Spate, who was a colleague of Dick's and now works for FEMA doing mediation work. And I will just say at the outset that we could spend a day talking about each one of these theological assumptions. They need that much time, and we don't have that much time. So just forgive me for moving pretty quickly through these. And I, I know that all of these need some conversation. But here they are. Assumption number one, institutions are a part of God's order, or a part of God's order. Walter Wink was a great biblical scholar who has passed away, and much of his work focused on the powers and the principalities that we read about in scripture. And about the powers, he says, these powers are the necessary social structures of human life, and it is not a matter of indifference. It's not a matter of indifference to God that they exist. God made them. For this reason, the account of creation in Genesis does not end in chapter two with the creation of the world, but in chapter 10 with the creation of the nations. The meaning is clear, Wink says, humanity is not possible apart from its social institutions. That's assumption one. Assumption two, institutions are not only a part of God's order, but God loves them. As a part of God's world, institutions are the object of God's love, and not just generally, but specifically. God loves Landry Cycle. God loves First Congregational Church. God loves Chase Bank. Assumption three, institutions are living systems meaning, first of all, that they're alive, that they're more than the bricks and mortar and, and the physicality of them. They have a, a kind of an animating spirit that is some, some combination of historical memory and shared values and proud successes and bitter disappointments. Every institution has a kind of 
culture or DNA, sometimes we talk about it. And you can feel it, can't you? Sometimes if you go into a store and it just has a certain kind of feeling, either positive or negative, they're living and they're systems. They act upon and influence the world and they are acted upon and impacted by the world they exist in. So here I just invite you to think for a moment about an organization that you are a part of. Might be the seminar, might be a place where you're working, be a place you have worked. And just think about that organization for a moment. Within that system, there are various needs and priorities. There are the people, whatever that, whatever that organization exists to do, there's the stakeholders, the people that you're trying to serve. There's the people who work there, the employees who are there and the needs that they have. And there's the question of the financial viability of that organization. My wife works in the school system. Yesterday was town meeting day in Vermont and a record number of school budgets were not passed. Right? There's a crisis in education, probably in a lot of places. And as I listen to the conversation about why school budgets are not passing, it's this mixture of needs and values within a system of the employees, the teachers that are there, the kids that you're trying to meet, the long-term viability of all of them. All our organizations are systems. Think of what the Apostle Paul words about the body of Christ in 1 Corinthians. And here's the fourth assumption, and this is a three-parter, and it might be the most challenging and important premise in this theology of institutions. Institutions are gifted and called, they are fallen, and they are capable of being redeemed. Our organizations are gifted and called, they are fallen, and they're capable of being redeemed. They're gifted and called and intended to be instruments of God's healing and reconciling purposes. They exist for good purposes, are capable of good things, and good things are expected of them. But they're also fallen. As members of God's order, they're prone to inflating and protecting themselves, to forgetting that they are part of a larger community of God's creation and to acting in ways that neglect or harm the common good. In that sense, they are just like us. And thirdly, institutions are capable of being redeemed. And this might be the one that is mostly a, a, a statement of faith, because depending on which institution or organization you're thinking about right now, it's a, perhaps a bit of a stretch. And all of us know organizations that feel a little bit closer to God's vision for how the world could be, and some that feel like they're a long, long way from that. But in their writings, Faith and Broholm and others remind us that we have no issue of thinking about a theology of persons that way, that all people are created good, all of us sin and fall short of the glory of God, all are capable of redemption. As a part of God's created order, couldn't we think of institutions in that same way? So I want to just talk now a little bit about um, what it might mean to apply this theology into a, a pastoral or more personal sense. What might this look like? for a local congregation or a cha or chaplaincy work. And I, and I wanna offer you a couple of suggestions and some of these might be very familiar to you, some not. Some of these might be things that you've seen done, perhaps not. But number one, let's start with the idea of calling. When we talk about becoming a loving critic of the institutions where we work, or trying to hold an institution in trust, this is where the, a theology of institutions gets personal. Because there's at least two things that we can say about a calling from a biblical perspective. The first is that it's all about you. And the second is that it's not all about you. God's call on our life is unique and specific to us. It's particular. 
the season of your life matters and what your gifts and strengths are matter and the experiences that you've had in life matter. So I believe when God called Mary, I don't think he was looking for a generic Mary. I think God was calling Mary. There was a reason. And when God called Moses or Paul or Sarah or Abraham or David, there was something specific about them, who they were and what their gifts were. So our calling at any given moment is all about us and the particularities of our life. And at the same time, our calling is never just about us. It's just not about what makes us happy or comfortable and it can't be follow your own bliss. Our callings also must have something to do with making the world a little bit more the way God intends it to look. So adapting Frederick Buechner's famous definition of vocation that it lies at the intersection of who you are and what the world needs. And this tension, this tension between what's going on in my life in particular and God's intention for the world leads us smack dab into some very personal decisions that we make when we are working within institutions. When do you stand up and become a whistleblower? When do you agree to join the committee to make your workplace a little bit better? When, like Esther, do you wait for such a time as this? And when do you act? How do you know when that time is? When, like Jesus, do you choose to leave the 99 and give your time and attention to the one? Or when, like Jesus, do you set your face towards Jerusalem, looking at the big picture, no doubt passing by many people, who needed healing and help, because at that moment, you're focusing on the big picture. When do you not focus at all about being a loving critic in the institution where you are? Because right now you have a two and a four year old at home and an aging parent, and you have got zero bandwidth to focus on anything but just showing up for work. When do you stay and be a part of this, the solution and when do you leave because you no longer can support or work within this organization? And can I just say, as an aside, by the way, that these are not just questions for the employees of Exxon, that they are the same questions that arise for many lay people and many pastors with regard to their church or their denomination. This is where a theology of institutions gets very personal. And this may be good news or bad news, but I'm not going to give you the answer to any of those questions because I don't believe there is one answer. I believe that it is part of our calling as spiritual leaders to accompany people as they wrestle with these very challenging questions. One way we can do that is come alongside people as they discern whether this is the moment to act or do something or not. But that becomes impossible if you've got a church with a whole bunch of people working a whole bunch of places. So in my mind, the gold standard are those, those places that have small communities, mission groups, or uh, that can, where people can accompany each other with these. I was very fortunate. We lived in DC for five years and we worshiped at Church of the Savior, which is really a pioneer in the in here in this area. And so twice a month, I would meet with my mission group. And the focus of this mission group, each of us just brought our work into that. And we just talked about what are the decisions that we are facing now? What does it mean to be faithful in the context of our work at that given moment? I really like Marjorie Bankson's definition of call. She says, Call has to do with discovering our particular field of action or the part of God's realm that is ours to tend at any given time. I'm just going to read that again. Call has to do with discovering our particular field of action or the part of God's realm that is ours to tend at any given time. 
and it moves around and it changes as our lives change. And so we need help in discerning that. So calling is the, is the first thought. Second thought, this is not a original creative idea, but it's about workplace visits. I don't know if any of you are doing that yet or if in the churches where you might be working. But because of the influence of Dick Broholm, I did way more workplace visits than I did hospital visits. My goal was to better understand what people did, try to help them see their work as ministry, try to bridge the gap between the church language and their worlds. I would try to come to where that was, and sometimes that meant coming to an office building or a dairy farm or a school. And in those visits, most of the time, I would just listen, trying to understand what the challenges were and then help them look at what they were doing through a theological lens. It was so clear to me that the work they were doing often was a ministry of healing or reconcil reconciliation or creativity or service. I'll never forget visiting Sue in her workplace. First of all, because I walked, it was, you know, picture the large open space with all the cubicles and I walked in the room, her next to me, and she announced in a very loud voice, hey everyone, this is Doug, he's my pastor. Right? <laughs> Um, but I sat with Sue, and Sue's job at IBM was it had some sort of quality control function. And so basically, you know, she would look at the electronics and, and find when there was problems with the electronics for the computer. And I had never, ever, ever thought about how important that was before. The only time I thought about my computer was when it didn't work, which was... 1% of the time, 99% of the time, when I turn on my computer, it works. And it's because of Sue. It's because of what she does. Then there was um, Raleigh, who worked at the auto body shop. And so I sat with Raleigh in, uh, in that garage. And I asked him, why do you, like, what got you into this work? Why, why do you do this work? <laughs> and he looked at me, and I'll never, this was years ago, but I'll never forget it. He looked at me just like with this intensity, and he said, I hate rust. I've always hated rust. <laughs> For you. And I thought about, maybe this is a bit of a stretch, but I thought about my crumpled car that I have brought into a body shop. And it comes back and it's whole again. It's healed. And there's kind of a redemptive action even to the work that, that Raleigh does in the auto body shop. Idea number three, congregational sharing. This is actually something we're about to start in our uh, small congregational church that I attend in Richmond, Vermont. We're going to be inviting people from the church just to come and just for a few minutes talk about where they work and what they do during the week. So here's some of the people that we're thinking about asking. Ernie works in a lab at University of Vermont. Amy is a small business owner. She sells prepared foods. Her mission is to make it easy for you to eat well. Molly's an administrator at a nonprofit that provides services and housing to seniors. Um, Jim owns a business that provides software to under robots, which is really odd in Richmond, Vermont, or Landau, but there you have it. Um, we're going to have other people who are retired and volunteering. As a church, we want to hear, what are you doing during the week? And what is meaningful to you? What is challenging? What difference does your faith make? But then here's where I'm really excited and where I think it's really going to get interesting, because after that, we want to start inviting people from the community, not people who are a part of the church, and invite them to come to speak to us as well. Probably won't use exactly the same language, but we want to hear from Julie, who is a local gym teacher and who really gets how impactful gym can be for young people. And we're going to invite Gabe, who owns the local restaurant and clearly has the gift of hospitality. We want to bring in the stories from people and their workplace and hear them talk about them so that our worship can be more connected to what people's work is in the world. And here's uh, the last idea. And it's kind of a whopper, 
but it really involves changing the whole mindset of what the ministry of the church is. Because I think most of us get sucked into thinking that success is measured by what happens inside the church, how many programs happen, what's on the calendar, attendance, giving. But what if the measurement of an effective and a thriving church was how well it was equipping people to be ministers throughout the week in their work? What if every decision a church made, church council, deacons, trustees, Christian education, was made through that lens? How is this decision helping us to equip the people in this church to live their faith where they are during the week? This guy named Dennis, who had this belief, and he wrote a book about it. He happened to be the CEO of a large energy company that had thousands of employees. And he wanted his church to support him and to hold him accountable. You know, he said, yeah, you could ask me to be on the trustee board, or you could help me to make decisions that are going to impact thousands of employees, not to mention the communities that we impact through our energy work. So he asked the elders of his church if he could submit his company's annual report as a part of his accountability to the church, and he got no response. So he just started bringing the annual report of his company and just laid it around and just kind of had it sitting around the church. No response. He said, I want my church to hold me accountable, not just for the 5% of my time that I'm here in this building. Next, he noticed that anyone who was paid a stipend or a salary by the local church was expected to report in on a regular basis. So at the church annual meeting, he raised his hand and asked to be put in the church budget for $1. A salary. They ignored him. This church had an after school program, an admired after school program at a pretty large church, I think. It took $100,000 of the $150,000 mission budget and it served 30 to 40 kids. This was a church in an in a urban center. And the church at one point was discussing changes to the program. And Dennis raised his hand and he proposed shutting it down which was not a popular decision because his wife had helped to start this program. But he said, in place of that, how about if we provide a $10,000 supplement to 10 young teachers who are a part of this congregation who work in the public schools in the city around this church? And these teachers would be marked by our church as God's ministers to the people in these neighborhood schools. They'd be supported and they'd be held accountable by the church. His point was that by supporting their work and for them to see that as a ministry would have more impact on the neighborhood than the center at the church. But it was voted down. He says this about trying to change the mindset. What if the services or the ministry of the church might include the efforts of the 15 public school teachers we have here and the two principals and the owner of a local florist shop and the four police officers and the county councilwoman and the metal lathe worker at a local factory and the CFO of a large international oil company and the headmaster of a school and the retail clerk at the local hardware store and the instructor at Gold's Gyms and the 42 mothers and fathers with small children at home. Couldn't we see that? as the ministry of this church. Maybe we need to start rethinking what the purpose of the church is. So I'm gonna close with this. It's, a, it's an imaginary conversation and it takes place between Jesus and Zebedee. Remember who Zebedee is? Anyone? Anyone remember who Zebedee is? Father of James and John. Thank you. Excellent. Yes. So you notice that um, you could Google in any community and you could go online to say, what are the local churches? And you'd find probably a, a St. James and you'd find a St. John and you'd find a St. Andrews and you'd find a, a St. Peter. Um, I don't think you'd find a St. Zebedee church anywhere. Right? So we don't know what happened, but you remember the story. This is Jesus calling his followers and, and Zebedee was the father of James and John and they dropped their nets, right? James and John did 
to follow Jesus. So this is an imaginary conversation. It's the next day and Jesus wanders back to the waterfront and Zebedee is there and he's mending his nets. And he sees Jesus and he calls him over and he says to Jesus, why did you call them and not me? And Jesus responds, well, why do you think you're not called? And Zebedee says, well, you told them to drop their nets, but you didn't say that to me. And Jesus says, Zebedee, I want to say something to you. I've seen you fish. I've watched you. I've seen the way you read the water and seem to know just when is the right time to drop the nets. And more than that, Zebedee, I've watched you in the marketplace. And I've seen you wrestle with what it means to set a fair price for your fish. And I've seen you the way you treat the employees that are working for you. And Zebedee, here's something else. I get hungry. We need fish. Fishing is your calling, Zebedee, and it is every bit as important as the calling of your son, James and John. So do it well. Do it fairly. Think about what justice and mercy and love mean in the context of your work. And just know that as you do that, you are following me. You are called. Thank you, Zebedee, for your ministry. And thank you for this time. We've got a couple of minutes, I think, right? So I would love to hear any questions or uh, any pushback or uh, anything at all. Mm -hmm. A couple of things, thank you very much. Um, was I was thinking about how in the Christian world, Judeo-Christian going into a Gentile world where people who worked were the lowly ones. The, the more closer you were to God, the less you worked, right? Those were the people who were godly. And the people who labored were, so that's the world in which the, the apostles and evangelists come into. Gentile world. So it's a real reversal there. Yeah. I was thinking about. Um, and um, I wondered, oh, I had lots of questions. I'll just ask one. Is there a distinction or an there's a distinction without a difference between an organization and an institution. I'm not making one for okay. this, but I meant to look that up and I didn't. <laughs> I, I, does anyone know? I, I don't know. Well, if you don't, I mean, I only meant, wanted to know what you thought. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, been I actually was thinking about that on the way down and I meant to look up to see if there was a difference. But for purposes of my uh, talk, no, I'm not making a distinction. Okay. In fact, I think institutions just feels a little, I, it's not a word that I would generally use. It's the word that came out of the work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because in the church, we also often have this thing of, you know, well, we're also a business. So I say, well, think of it this way. When church is a purpose, it has a mission. Every mission needs an organization. Hmm. And every organization needs certain things, maybe a building, maybe a budget, maybe a, 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 a this arm or that arm. Yeah. Um, and then together so that they don't, don't split them. Yeah, yeah. I should mention, by the way, I'm, Mark, I'm looking over at you, uh, that one of the people that really was central to this work on the theology of institutions was Gabe Thacker, who was deeply involved in this work. And I don't remember when you came in and... Uh, Toward the end. <laughs> but I know they drew on uh, this work. Yeah, so I, I just wanted to thank you for um, your presentation tonight. Um, my grandmother, who has not done as much research as, as you have, 
um, she was a pastor and she was watching a Charlie Brown episode and the characters quoted these words. They said, every tree in the forest is a missionary. And so she took that back to the church and began to try to have her followers look at the church as the headquarter. But we were mobilizing um, the ministry. So everything that you do, everywhere you go, we are all representatives um, of ministry, not necessarily um, just the pulpit. So I really thank you for the presentation. It was rich, and I really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and there's so much to say about uh, what it means to do that in workplace. And right now, especially in the evangelical world, there's there's some definitions of what workplace ministry means, and it, and it sometimes has more to do with evangelizing in the workplace. And I think this is not so much that what I'm talking about. In a way, that's the, that's the easy button. But it's really getting into kind of what is the stuff of your work. And by the way, we need to also say that what that looks like, depending on where you are in the org chart, makes a difference in, in what you can do and how you can do it. And um, gosh, there's so much here, you, you know, but I, just one illustration of, because uh, I, I kind of got my radar up for example. So I was in Chicago over the weekend, my mother-in-law's birthday. Uh, we got dropped off at the airport. You know how at the airport, there's the people now who just keep you moving along, moving along. And you know, you're not allowed to do that. And, and some of them can be really mean and scary, right? Um, and this woman, you know, came over and we were doing our hugs and she was just great. She said something about, but you seem to really love each other. And then she said, do you want a picture? So her job was to move us along, but she <laughs> took my phone and took a picture as we're saying goodbye. And I just thought of, I don't know, but you know, here's someone who is truly making this work significant. But I raised that to say there's a danger sometimes in romanticizing sort of that, the person who's, who's got a really difficult, hard job and saying, well, if you just saw that as ministry, it would be it would be great. And I, and I think we need to be careful. Now, you know, there's, there's all kinds of systematic issues around this, but I, I do know so many people, you know, I work a lot in hospitals and I have met a number of people who are in environmental services and there's no doubt in their mind that they serve a higher purpose in that work. And they know that. And I, I want to know who helps that, who is a burden in supporting not to dismiss any needs there might be for everything, you know, whatever the salary injustices are, but um, we all know that feeling a sense of meaning and purpose in what we do is a part of what makes us so meaningful. You have one more question. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Durante. Okay. Um, so, as you work with clients and you are, and I, you may have spoken on this, I may have missed it, but as you look at the clients and approach um, sort of like your objectives with a theology of love or theology of institutions, are you, do you find it easy to be transparent with your clients about the role that love plays in the work that you're doing? Because um, I, since it's healthcare, I, I would assume that maybe some parents have some idea, like some centering of love, but it it could be also problematic. Yeah. I I, I don't know. I, I love your use of love there. <laughs> what I'm crystal clear about is almost everyone I work with in healthcare does have a sense of calling to that work, whether they are religious or not. They're not doing it the money they're not doing it for the status and so if, if i equate calling and love absolutely and but part of our job i think for any of us who try to accompany people alongside them in their work is to to listen well and then as theologians i think it's to listen for what they're saying and then if they are people of faith whatever that tradition is to help them make the connection because I, most people don't see their work as ministry. And it's like, a, it's, it's, it's so rewarding to see someone understand what they do through this new lens because, because for people who are people of faith, that, that's a core part of the value system. And if you can connect 
up those two things. And if you can kind of be the bridge there, some people get that intuitively, but others, I think we have a function to just listen and then take our theological education and say, you know what that, you know, like the auto body thing. As we bring this to a close, I wonder just as you're able, if we could rise and just offer a blessing on our speaker. Uh, after this lecture is complete, we're going to go over to the second floor common room for special amendments dinner because this is a special lecture, so we have really good catering. <laughs> so we'll send you off into spring break with really good food from Barasa. We get wine tonight, <laughs> and uh, we'll have a chance to talk further with our speaker, who's going to be remaining with us also through worship, and we'll have our ordinary Emmaus uh, worship starting around 7.15, a testimony from student John Ort, and it'll be a great night. The band is warming up now. That's why they're not here, but uh, thank you so much for attending this gathering, and as you feel um, comfortable, if you could extend a hand to Doug, our speaker, and send him forth with a blessing. O oh, Holy One, we thank you for bringing Doug full circle to share with learners in this day his accumulated wisdom that began or began again at Andover Newton, and now he shares it with this community together. God, we give you thanks for this lecture. We give you thanks for this night. God, I ask that you bless the students who are here, that they might have rich and renewing breaks. And we thank you, God, for calling us. And we thank you for giving us models and frameworks so we can try to begin to make sense for what it is that you require of us beyond our love and our justice and our humility as we walk with you. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Thanks, everybody. See you.